is that the FBI you have a federal warrant for this address. Keep your hands up and follow orders. This is the FBI. They handcuffed me and my wife out here. They wanted me to sit on the curb uh, while they were carrying this out, uh, something that I refused to do. They wanted my wife to sit on the curb out here that she refused to do. As I was coming out, this big old drone met me. revolutionary organization that's done something here on the ground practically for African people is the one that's come under attack. Institution that offers a community radio station, a newspaper, a commercial kitchen, an Aquaba Hall rental space, and community office for our organizers. That was the building that has come under attack. Yeah, breach, what do you need? Uh, you need one. I don't know. Oh, it's all better than money. All right. Thank you. We will build a movement of white people that says, Yes. 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 They see in the African People's Socialist Party a vanguard for the struggle for the liberation of our people. They see that because not just what we do here in the United States, but because we had the temerity to do like Garvey, to do like Malcolm X, and take the struggle of black people around the world. such a great honor to introduce the chairman Amalia Shatella. Um, on that day when that happened, because let's just be real, I mean, North, the North community I'm so proud of, and most people in this room, I have a very good relationship with. And so there really is no separation. There is no separation or ideological separation between myself and Chairman O'Malley Yeshitella, I'm probably the vice chair of the Black is Back Coalition. He's the chair. So if they're rating him, what does that say about me? And what does that say about everyone in this room? Which is why I'm so glad you turned out because it was a warning signal for all of us. One of the first things I did, I mean, it was very alarming, but I thought, oh my gosh, I got things I got to do. I better go in and take care of this before. You know, they come after me or anybody else. So that's what I did. I said, I got to make sure I take care of some of the business that was pending. Um, again, you've heard so much about the chairman. And um, I just want to say I stand by him. I stand by him based on his principles and the work that he has done in the African People's Socialist Party. I am very proud of the Black is Back Coalition. And I'm like, print it, is what I say to the federal government. We are not afraid. Brothers and sisters, I'd like to express my deep, profound appreciation for everybody that's come out uh, to this meeting on tonight. 
I want to extend a special thanks and appreciation to Comrade uh, Brother Cox and to the Refile uh, Center for hosting uh, this meeting and for just how uh, gracious uh, you have been in welcoming me uh, and the Uhuru Movement and Black is Back uh, Coalition. Also, uh, I want to thank uh, Comrade Sister Vice Chairwoman uh, Lisa Davis. Uh, she is the Vice Chair of the Black is Back Coalition. <laughs> And um, I met Sister Lisa here, perhaps it was 2012, 2013, or some, sometime around that time frame. And uh, I met her here uh, at a Black is Back uh, conference that we had, a national a annual conference. And she was in the audience, and she raised the question of having to do something around the issue of health care for African people. And she talked about how if an African went to prison and conscious and politically active prisoners, uh, uh, politically active uh, uh, individuals would uh, fill up the courtrooms and go to the prisons to see about them, but uh, they'd snatch us up in these hospitals and medical institutions on a regular basis and, and we have to go through that alone. And she thought that was extremely problematic. And she wanted to see if we could do something to take this issue on because I don't have to tell you about how African people and all colonized people are victimized uh, uh, by what they characterize as a healthcare uh, system. And of course, there is no healthcare system at all uh, here. And so she has played a leading role first in heading up, I asked her, why don't you head up a working group on this question? And she jumped right in and did it, and of course she was doing it whether I asked her or not, and uh, beyond that she became the vice chair. I want to express appreciation to the People's Organization of Progress, for progress. Uh, also because uh, uh, it has been another entity that has opened its arms uh, to, to me, uh, to the Uhuru movement at different critical times, and even when we were working to build uh, the first mobilization uh, uh, in Washington, D.C., the Black is Black Coalition uh, held the first, the first, the very first uh, demonstration, national demonstration uh, against the Obama regime at the White House. Uh, we did the first one when uh, many of the militants and so-called revolutionaries and communists and what have you uh, refused to touch it. Uh, and uh, the People's Organization of Progress, though it had a different position then we, on this question, uh, recognize the significance of being able to mobilize against the kinds of things that the U.S. was doing uh, at that time under the Obama regime. And they came out for support, and they opened their doors, their meetings uh, to me, uh, so that I was able to come through there. And I just wanted to express uh, appreciation for that and recognition of the kind of unity uh, that I know that is here. Newark, you have your own extraordinary history in terms of the struggle of our people, and I want to acknowledge that. So, much has been said. You've seen some things. Uh, I feel it necessary to recount them myself uh, because the attack on our party and our movement on July 29th was of tremendous significance to our struggle. And we have to take it as something more significant than the, the uh, current news cycle. Uh, when it first happened, of course, there was an explosion of interest uh, by Africans and everybody. I mean, you, you, you'll be surprised, perhaps, uh, to see the numbers of, uh, of people and organizations from throughout the world and inside this country who uh, express that express support, solidarity, opposition to what the FBI has done. And people did it for different reasons. Uh, most of them were genuinely opposed to what the FBI had done and uh, genuinely uh, expressed support and solidarity. That was genuine. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but people came from their own experiences in terms of how they approached that question and how that question was understood. And so as, as the news cycle 
uh, continues. The next thing that's uh, being talked about, if it's not uh, 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 Chris Rock getting slapped, or if it's not uh, 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 the woman in England, uh, the predator in England, uh, who just died, uh, or if it's not that uh, 39 people associated with Donald Trump have been subpoenaed, uh, this news cycle is just going around and around and it's all being bunched up together. And so they, there's a tendency and ability to assume that what happened July 29th uh, to my home, uh, to our offices, et cetera, just is a part of the pattern. It's just a part of what's going on, part of what's happening. But it is of critical significance. It is of critical significance to black people, to Africans, and we have to organize and deal with it. Uh, because this, this extraordinary claim uh, that somehow Listen, uh, next month, next month, uh, I will be 81 years old. And, 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 and for most of my life, for most of my life, I have been fighting against this system and what it does to Africans and oppressed people around the world. For most of my life. And, and I have done it before I ever met a Russian. You understand? I did it not because of Russia, but because of America. I did it not because of Russians, but because what America does and has done historically to black people. That's the thing that has motivated me. I just think that we have to be clear on that. So everything they said is a lie. They stole my phone. They stole my iPad. They stole my wife's a computer. They stole uh, tons and tons, thousands of, uh, of, of text messages, of communiques that we've had with each other around the world and with each other. They stole a Russian flag uh, that we had. I had bought four, uh, uh, especially during this, uh, this, this, this vicious war. It's a continuation of a war that's been going on for more than 100 years. I guess Russia started off as Soviet Russia when all the colonial powers in the world, including the United States and Japan, invaded Russia in 1918 after the successful Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. Oh, See? And, and even when I talk about that, I, I really want us to understand some things about the Russian Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution, what it's all about, what we are dealing with right now, at this very moment. Because people appreciate Lenin, I appreciate Lenin. People appreciate the Bolshevik Revolution, I appreciate the Bolshevik Revolution. But the Bolshevik Re Revolution was ushered in, was, con was, was made possible and likely because of the first imperialist world war, they call it World War I. Do you know what that war was fought for? It was, to, it was a war to divide the world between predators. It happened just a few short years after the colonial powers of the world got together in Berlin, Germany, and, and prevented going to war by making a deal among themselves by carving up what? Africa. 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 And so, and so uh, this was the first attempt uh, to prevent the Europeans from going to war again because there have been war and war and war and they've ended the wars and they come up with a new a kind of deal, relationship between themselves. They even change the borders of the countries and things like that from time to time based on that. Uh, so the first imperialist world war, and so people remember that. It stands out. Lenin stands out. The Bolshevik stands out. A critical moment in history, but what was it? that made the Bolshevik Revolution possible and likely. First of all, Lenin and the Bolsheviks in Russia refused to participate uh, in, the, in, the, in the imperialist war, uh, in the so-called defending the fatherland like all the other European communists did. Lenin said, not us. And even members of his own party wanted to deal with it, but Lenin said, not us. But what was it that drove the revolutionary process to the surface in the first place. It was the colonial, the struggle against colonialism that was happening around the world. This is the thing that gave urgency.
necessary to the first imperialist world war. You did. We did. That's what, when they were dividing up, they created the, the so-called League of, of Nations for the purpose of, of having this assembly, this parliamentary process, where the white colonial powers could get together and have peaceful control of the world. We wouldn't have to kill each other. We wouldn't have to fight each other to dominate the world. That's what it was created for. This is the League of Nations. But what was happening? Revolutionary war struggles were happening all around the world. When they were sitting around the League of Nations, they were talking about who was going to get what part of Southwest Africa. Who was going to get this and that. And that's when Garvey stood up and said, Africa for Africans. Right. And home and abroad. That's, right. that's when Garvey stood up and said that. That's, that's the context of Garvey's statement. He wasn't just coming up and saying, what kind of slogan can we come up with today? He was responding to concrete, material reality in the world where the colonial powers were talking about how they were going to continue to control and redivide Africa. But that's not the only thing that was happening. You're talking about the struggles that you saw how France and England were involved in. You see what's happening now in the so-called uh, uh, Middle East. Much of the borders that you see there were devised by France and England. They created what you now call Syria. They're the ones who created what we now identify as Lebanon. They're the ones who are responsible for the courage not having a homeland so that they are uh, 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 involved in struggle all over the place. They did that just like they sat down in Berlin and created the different ones of us, defined us the way they wanted to define us. So this is, this is the world they created, but they had to struggle. Struggle was happening in Nicaragua. People wanted to be free. And so you had, at the same time, this war that was being made against San Nino. In Nicaragua, they were dropping bombs uh, on us in Oklahoma. First military era bombardment that happened in, on, in this Western Hemisphere happened in, in Oklahoma against African people referred to as Black Wall Street and, and the people who were struggling against colonialism in Nicaragua. It's the colonial dynamic that was driving everything because the whole white world rested on the platform of the colonial domination. You don't believe it? There are Marxists in here. And what Marx said was that what he referred to uh, 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 as, as, what did he call it? What kind of slavery did he characterize it? He, he called it uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, wage slavery, he called it. And even the name. He wasn't talking about Spartacus when he said wage slavery. <laughs> he wasn't talking about Spartacus. He said wage slavery required as a pastor, wage slavery in Europe, required as a pastor slavery, pure and simple and what they call the new world, that's us. He was making the statement that capitalism, capitalism came into existence and required uh, the colonial domination of the peoples of the world. Our struggle, July 29th, in most economically depressed sector of St. Louis, and this attack by the FBI, and the attack in St. Petersburg, Florida, this started 600 years ago when Portugal uh, began initiating the slave, the selling black people. That's where it started. This is the process that hooked the whole world up into a single world economy. It was a colonial economy. It's been characterized as a capitalist mode of production. It's a colonial mode of production. Mm -hmm. All of the production rested on the base of African and other peoples being colonized. You look around the world, you look at the so-called Americans, everything you see and what they characterize as the Americans came about as the exist as a consequence of the so-called slave trade. Nicaragua, Venezuela, Cuba, Puerto Rico, all of them. The attack on African African people. You need to understand this because otherwise they'll be able to convince you that serving subpoenas on 30 some odd members of the Trump administration of Trump supporters is equal to this attack that they made on Africa on July 29th in St. Louis and in St. Petersburg, Florida. 
It ain't the same. It ain't the same. And what we're looking at, when you're looking at Trump, you're looking at activity that's occurring on this pedestal that Marx talked about. That is required for the existence of the whole capitalist system. Y'all with me? Mm -hmm. That's true. That's why you see, I used to be able to see, like the uh, workers uh, in oil fields in Nigeria making the price of, of gasoline go up in Newark. Workers who are struggling for their rights to take their resources in Nigeria, the price of oil goes up. The price of gasoline goes up in various other places around the world because it's a colonial mode of production. And if you can't see that, you can't see yourself. And you can't see your own significance. And it's critical that we see ourselves and see our own significance. I just want to say that. I think it's really important for us to understand that. We can talk more about that at some other time. I think we must talk about it. Because revolution is a science and an art. That's right. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, what we have to become more aware of and conscious of, and we were extraordinarily conscious of this in the 1960s, even though there were so many questions that went unresolved. The fact is that we were not talking about Black Lives Matter. We were not talking about hands up, don't shoot. In the 1960s. The fact is that people were organizing, black people were organizing, oppressed people, or Puerto Ricans were organizing, indigenous people here and around the world were organizing to take power over our own lives. If you ain't talking about power, what the hell are you doing in the room? And then if you are talking about power, then you need the instruments through which you will attain that power. Otherwise, as Brother Carr said, he reminded me of my uncle, uh, who was a pretty bad guy, he said, conversation is the cheapest commodity on the block. <laughs> Everybody got one, yeah. right? So it's not what you say, it's what you do, yeah, right. Right? Right, right? And if you believe that we have to be free, then freedom has to be translated in having power over our own lives. Right. And if we talking about power over our own lives, what power are we talking about except state power? How do we get state power? Come on. State power is that force that monopolizes violence in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the interest of whatever is the social system that exists at the moment. State power is the FBI coming to my house at 5 o'clock in the morning threatening me and my wife and destroying our properties. State power, the state legalizes itself. The state legalizes itself. I know they say, well, the Constitution says this and this and this. The state legalizes itself. I mean, I remember, I think about this. Uh, the fact is that Nat Turner, the extraordinary Nat Turner, uh, who struck out, he said, strike at night and spare no one. That was his slogan. It wasn't, hands up, don't you. It wasn't black lives don't matter. She strike at night and spare no one. Sort of sounds like a brother over there in Haiti who said Kubite, Bulika. He said, he says, he said, cut heads and burn houses. Because you have to have your own power. It's the responsibility, the duty of the slave to kill the slave master. And destroy the system of slavery. Hmm. That's right. How can you live? How can there be anything like dignity among a people that voluntarily accepts this? But Africans don't voluntarily accept it. And that's why you have this colonial state power. That's why I know some of you believe in this stuff, but it ain't true about the so called Willie Lynch syndrome. Ain't no white man wrote something and then said, just how you control black people 300 exactly. years, et cetera, et cetera. Right, right. If the white man wrote that and that worked, then they wouldn't have to have a police on every corner in your community. Come on. That's right. That's, right. Well, that's, that's, the, right. that's the black petty bourgeoisie. Don't expect to fight nobody about nothing that's talking about Willie Lynch did that and blaming us. 
on the thing instead of the state. And the colonial state is vicious, has no regard for those of us who are colonized anywhere on the planet Earth, nowhere on Earth. And when they deal with us, things like, uh, things like conventions, uh, as it relates to the United Nations and other things, like they don't, they don't, it doesn't matter. It's war without terms that they make against us. My wife and I were sitting up at, when they came to our house at 5 o'clock in the morning, we were sitting around the table uh, talking about how we were going to be dealing with the day. I'm getting ready to go to the gym. That was Friday. And so that's back and biceps for me. <laughs> and, uh, and what she was doing, uh, we were talking because that's the same day that we uh, were implementing a program that she uh, is over. She's over most of the economic work that we're involved in and this kind of political work too. Because we say that politics ain't nothing but what? Concentrated economics. Politics ain't nothing but concentrated economics. And our problem, of course, is that we ain't got no economics, or we somebody else's economics used to control our politics. <laughs> Except the politics of revolution. Mm. The politics of anti-colonialism, right? And then you have economic programs, Brother Cop, right? Yeah. You have economic programs to negate the power of the colonizer. Right. That's your political program. And so as you're seeing that their politics and economics are one. So anyway, we're sitting around at the table, and we are initiating this program that on this day, we had planned for 20, and, but there would be something like 16 African women who would go through this program. We've initiated training doulas, midwives, right? Something like that. Because in St. Louis, you have a situation where enough black babies die in the first year of life to fill 15 kindergarten classes every year. The Russians didn't tell me that. That's what I'm saying? The Russians didn't tell me that. They're killing my babies, you understand? And if I complain about it, they say, it ain't you talking, it's the Russians saying that, right? This is how they're trying to divert uh, criticism from what this system does to African people. And so uh, that's why we happen to be up, because we're talking about this program. By the way, the program did happen. The sisters did come to the Uhura House. The sisters did get the training to be doulas, and the sisters are now involved in training that we're providing so they can set up their own business as doulas, taking care of business, you understand? So that's what we do. That's what we were doing, and that's how we happened to be up when they came. And so here, here we are sitting around uh, talking, and this, this racket from outside comes, everybody in, in this residence, come out with your hands up and your hands empty. Mm. pre dog. And so first, we're not sure if, 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 if we're really hearing this correctly. Uh, because in St. Louis, you know, occasionally you have tornadoes coming through and there's tornado warning and what have you. So this racket comes out. And so are they talking about us? <laughs> and so uh, I asked her to stay, let me go first. And, and you stay and call the comrades, let them know we're being raped. They say, this is the FBI. And when I went downstairs, I'm greeted, first of all, by an armored vehicle parked in front of my house. Parking is bad enough without that. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> and so here's an armored vehicle parked in front of the house. And when I open the door, as the comrade mentioned, uh, uh, I'm hit in the chest, not by, not by one or two or three, but a whole bunch of red dots coming from uh, targeting lasers on automatic weapons being held by this military force in camouflage outfits and flak jackets, right? Uh, that's what hits me right in the chest. I opened the door, and, and when I opened the door, uh, I didn't see it, but my wife uh, was uh, affected because this drone comes right behind, right, uh, behind me, 
and goes up the stairwell uh, and almost hits her in the head. At the same time, flashbang grenades, grenades are going off all around the house. And uh, I was to learn that even they had penetrated the stairwell, the back stairwell of the house, and grenades are going off in the back stairwell of the house. This is, this is what the FBI did. This is a military force. I'm not talking about some suit and tie wearing, wingtip, uh, shoe, uh, shod uh, uh, white guys. I'm talking about forces in military flag jackets, camouflage outfits with automatic weapons that are telling me in no uncertain terms that I'll kill you, that you will die. Now, if I want you to die, you will die. That's what those, those target lasers uh, were saying to me. When I walked out, of course, I'm thinking Fred Hampton. Because it was 4 o'clock in the morning when the FBI set him up in Chicago and murdered him and, and, and Mark Clark. And so that's what's on my mind when I walked out, out the door. And so I really thought that, uh, that uh, they were going to kill me at that moment. And instead, you know, they asked me, they required me to come out. They zip tied me behind my back. They put handcuffs on my wife behind her back. And I'm asking, what is this about? Say, well, we got a, a warrant, a search warrant for your house. I said, well, let me see it. They say, well, I don't have it with me right now, but some, you know, but it's, it is over there somewhere with somebody. So uh, uh, then they take my cell phone, and as I mentioned, they took all of these other devices that we had. They stole them all stole all of these devices. And, and they wanted me to sit on the curb, where then you can sit in the back seat of the car when you want to sit on the curb. I don't want to sit in place. I want to, I want to, I want to do a rest of the snipes and bottles. And uh, so uh, finally they said, uh, I'm, are we under arrest? No, you're not under arrest. So they said, they said finally you can leave. Before that, they said that there's an indictment that's coming down later today of a Russian national who's in Russia and your name is involved in the indictment. Let me see the indictment. They say uh, that's going to be happening later this morning. I can't show it to you now. But it's going to be in the news. It's going to be a lot of, this is going to make the news, is what they said. And so it is, you know, like a propaganda ploy, among other things that they are doing. And uh, so uh, they occupied the Uhura Solidarity Center on the south side of St. Louis, which is a majority white uh, community. Uh, they used battering rams, knocking in doors and what have you. They used the uh, flashbang grenades there as well. They held people at gunpoint there, handcuffed, uh, and they occupied the Solidarity Center for something like six hours. They were in my house. Yeah, uh, they said, if I wanted to, listen, brother, I see you gone, but we need that support, concrete support. Got to have it. All right. <laughs> all right. And uh, so they, they took all of those devices and what have you. So they have everything. I mean, they know uh, when I had an argument with my wife, if we texted about it or we said anything like that about it, uh, uh, we didn't. <laughs> but uh, 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 they, they have all kinds of stuff. They will, they will use this to tell the story they want to tell. But this is what I want to tell you. We're a transparent organization. They have put, they have put snitches, informants, provocateurs in our organization. And some of these provocateurs have been relatively effective. They've even warned some other Africans to take the most reactionary stances against our party. Let me tell you who we are. All you've got to do is open the Burning Spear newspaper. You see what our program is. It's been there since 19, what, 79. Our program around reparations is in there since 1979. Our program de declaring the treatment of the peoples of uh, Africans and others as genocide is 1979. It's been there. This notion that somehow the Russians had us to go around and participate in getting petitions because the United States is committing genocide against black people is nonsensical. Yeah. It is easily disproved by the fact that you can go to the Bernstein newspaper, look at the program. From 
1979, you will see that position. They said that, uh, that we uh, ran a campaign in 2016, uh, was it 2017 and 2019, uh, in St. Petersburg, Florida, and St. Uh, uh, Louis, Missouri, because the Russians wanted to do this, wanted us to do this, because they can bring uh, discredit to the electoral process in this country. I mean, you got thousands of white people on January 6th scaling the walls of the Capitol like spider people, <laughs> chasing the vice president through the hallowed halls, talking about hanging him and defecating in the joint. Not a single flash bang grenade gone off yet. Yeah. But we are the ones who are bringing disrepute to the electoral process in this country. They have they have something like 400, more than 400 pieces of legislation in state legislators throughout this country right now designed to undermine the ability of black people to participate in elections. They did that, not me. And 18 states in this country have already passed laws limiting the ability of black people to vote. And we are the ones who are somehow undermining the pristine uh, electoral process in this country. I don't believe that. And then, of course, opposition on Ukraine. Because uh, we say uh, that what has happened in Russia is a continuation of war, and Ukraine is a continuation of the same war. And as recently, of course, uh, when was it? Nin is, uh, 19, was it 97? And when was the, the collapse of, of, the, of the Soviet Union? 91. Uh, and you saw Clinton, you know, running around uh, celebrating before, I don't know if they had found that Monica Lewinsky's dress was missing at that time. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, then, and then they began they were moving sharply and hard, you know, like uh, taking up all the space. They were rushing. But before that, James Earl Carter. And Zbigniew Brzezinski, his national security advisor, had gone into Afghanistan. They had, they're the ones who created the modern jihad. They trained them, armed them, sent them into Afghanistan because they were friends with the Soviet Union and because Afghanistan was close to the border of the Soviet Union. You knew that. They know that. They hope that you don't know it, or they hope that you don't care. They hope that we will not be organ well enough organized to do anything to respond to it. So they don't like our position on Ukraine. And you're supposed to like the position on Ukraine. Because, uh, I mean, you can't pick up anything. Well, now you can with the dead white woman uh, uh, in England. You know, you can't turn on anything. You know, I'm stuck in one of these hotel rooms, and every time I turn on the hotel television, they still burn that woman. <laughs> what do you what call it? Dead but not yet dead? Oh. <laughs> uh, and, 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 you know, so, and then this creep, Zelensky, this, this remarkable, heroic Zelensky, they have given how many billions of dollars? I know the last time that was good. Something like 60 billion dollars or so. That's my money. I ain't talking about just as no taxpayer. I'm talking about the reparations that you want. So what the hell are you doing spending it there? You know, uh, so these, you know, this is just ridiculous. And I'm not even, I'm not, I don't expect America or uh, Oh, this guy, uh, Joe Biden, Hunter's daddy. <laughs> I'm not expecting them to take some kind of revolutionary stance, but I'm expecting all these white people who say they believe in American democracy, enshrined in these noble documents of freedom of speech. That's all I am. Exercising free speech, you say. Hold, hold you to that. I'm not asking you to be a revolutionary. 
and you say that uh, you believe uh, in uh, what they like to refer to uh, as, uh, how do you call it, uh, um, uh, some kind of imperial democracy, a, a, demo uh, a capitalist democracy. Uh, but the basic uh, thing about it is that there's supposed to be this equality uh, that people enjoy uh, through being able to uh, exercise uh, the struggle for power through the electoral process. You heard that before. No rights. Uh, they, they said we're supposed to be able to do that through the electoral process. But the fact of the matter is that, uh, and this is really important for this is issue, that we have never had access to the electoral process. Never had access to the electoral process. The elections in, in this country are nothing but non-violent contests between different sectors of the ruling class for controlling the state. I'm not saying don't do something with them. I'm saying that's what it was constructed of. And it was, they were created before, before they even assumed or suggested that black people could vote. And about the time of 1965, that's when the Voting Rights Act was passed in this country. By this time, of course, they killed Malcolm in 65, wasn't it? And then in 68, they killed King. And then in uh, 69, they killed Fred. And then throughout the 60s, they're just killing all revolutionaries and destroying revolutionary organizations all together. So then they say, you can vote. But now you ain't got nothing to vote for. You ain't got no program to vote for. The Democratic Party is not a revolutionary organization. It will not have your program on the ballot. So we put reparations on the ballot and say, OK, we're going to vote. We initiated schools where we're teaching ordinary people how to participate in the electoral process, but we're teaching them what it is that you should be looking at when you participate. Put reparations on the ballot. There are some places in this country where you can actually Put reparation on the ballot. Put it on the ballot. Make them have to vote for it. Even if they say no, 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 that informs black people what this country thinks. And that because every every people, every instance, people always look for the easy way to solve the problem. You never heard anybody say, let's find a hard way to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. So the easy way seems to be vote. Okay, vote. Vote for rep put black reparation on the ballot. Put black community control of the police on the ballot. Uh, put the, these kinds of issues in questions. And so with the Black is Back Coalition, we pulled together a 19-point national democratic program for self-determination, national black agenda for self-determination. We took it through 11 states in this country uh, with conventions, and black people voted on that. And so we said, from now on, any African who's running for office, anybody who's running for office, even Joe Biden, or uh, uh, a burning something. Running for office, you gotta adopt. You gotta adopt this 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 program for the support of black people. That ain't, they don't want that. They don't want black people to participate in elections. And I can tell you what they did. They had 21 carloads of uh, of pigs who attacked the debate for mayor in St. Petersburg, Florida. 2000. What was that? 17. 2017. That's when. When uh, Lisa, the same meeting that Lisa was talking about, the white man who was running for mayor also said that you got your reparation when you got Obama, and then catch the next flight that back to Africa. Mm -hmm. That was it. They had twenty. They didn't send the police to get him. They sent twenty-seven carloads of police for a debate <laughs> that the party was involved in. I want to say that. Now, one thing I want to say is that we have to work to do. There are three things that's clear in terms of what's been identified by the United States government as problematic. One, Russia. They see a real contention with Russia now. The whole social system is in tremendous disrepair. Uh, disrepair. The whole thing is fracturing. The American society is fracturing. You got, there's not, it's not clear whether there's going to be an election in 2024, and if there is going to be an election in 2024, it's not clear what is going to be the outcome. I don't mean in terms of who gets elected. I mean in terms of who will be allowed to be elected, and if they get elected, will they be allowed to be seated? You think that's far fetched? No. I'm telling you, I'm looking at the at journals of the bourgeoisie. That ain't written for us. You won't find this in your checkout lines when you uh, go on to get your groceries and stuff, but read foreign affairs. Read the things they're concerned about. 
read about the, the annual uh, Munich Security Council meetings. They have every year in Munich, Germany, where, where you have uh, ambassadors and you have people who heads of state, Zuckerberg, attend these meetings. Read how in 2020, one of the big issues that they were dealing with, at least the big shots, is the, is the, is the approaching restlessness. Did you hear what I just said? I ain't talking about some white kid from Buffalo who goes, from, who goes into Buffalo and kills all these people. They say he's inspired by some kind of, of, of uh, replacement theory. I'm talking about the big shots here. These are the thinking representatives of white power who are having these discussions about approaching restlessness, the disappearance of the so-called West. And by West, it's not simply geographic, because they're talking about white people in New, New Zealand as well, and Australia. You know, they're talking about the colonizers. And they are, all of them are afraid of being replaced, and they will be replaced. Because the oppressed peoples of the world are colonized, will take power over our own lives, and the whole social system rests on the foundation of our oppression. I'm asking you to join with us. Uh, go to handsoffuhuru.org. Uh, uh, participate in building this massive campaign that we have to build. Because we're not treating this as a defense committee, because we are talking about a counter-offensive committee. They attacked us. We, I was there in the 60s. I did voter registration and education work. I worked for this guy, who was it who they sent looking for Monica Lewinsky's dress? Who got his dress? Her, what's his name? George. What, what's his name? Bernie. Bernie and George. I did voter registration work in a program uh, that he headed in the 1960s. I faced, you know, uh, frothing at the mouth crackers who would kill you for just trying to get uh, African people registered to vote. I was an outside agitator. I've seen the situation where they would bomb our churches, saying that we were sent by Russians, saying that we were sent by outsiders and what have you. What in the hell is the difference in a, in a, in a, a, a white person, a colonizer, bombing a church in Birmingham in 1963 because outsiders are responsible for it because people want to vote, and the FBI bombing my house at 5 o'clock in the morning in July 29th because they said the Russians told us to be involved in the electoral process. I want to sue the FBI for violation of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. <laughs> but we need money because it ain't over. And because uh, the situation in this country is very serious. And the country, the leaders of this country, have astutely, if you will, determined that Russia is a problem because it's intruding on spaces that they've occupied uh, by themselves for a long period of time. They decided that China is a problem. They see China is the big problem, uh, by the way, uh, because China is intruding on these economic and political spaces that they've monopolized for a long period of time. And as quiet as it's kept, they decided that Africa is a point of contention as well. It is critical. There's not a single modern economy in the world that could exist without the resources that they've taken from our Africa. That not one, not China, not Russia, not America, not England, uh, none of them could exist without those resources. And for the first time since the Garvey movement, we are building a revolutionary African movement, not, not a Nigerian movement, not a Ghana movement, not a so-called Black American movement, but an African movement. The African People's Socialist Party exists in the United States, and they know it. That's how they know my address. Uh, exists uh, in the Caribbean, they know it. Uh, we, they got all of our information, all the texts, all of the communications that we've had with each other. We exist all over the continent of Africa. We exist uh, in England, black people. Uh, we exist in France, African people. And if you're in France, Anybody who's familiar with that know if you're in France, you're in various other Francophone states uh, on the continent of Africa as well. You understand? And uh, we, have, we have presence in places like Belgium and Sweden. Uh, we are there rebuilding a revolutionary movement because we completed, concluded a long time ago that the African Revolution has outlived its capacity when fought within the confines of the colonial created borders, that's there. No borders control what France does in Africa. 
No borders control what America does in Africa. No borders control the exploitation of our people by all the European powers of America and the other rest of them. And no borders should be able to control our struggle for liberation. So they see these as problems. I know I'm not just one of these frogs at the mouth black nationalists who love Africa so much I just tell you anything. I'm telling you to look at the fact that for the first time in its 246 year history, uh, the United States Marines has given a four star to a black man. His name is Michael Lang Langley. You know what his job is? Africa. He is over controlling Africa. You know what the outgoing head of Africa said? That the biggest strategic problem they got on the continent of Africa is is extremism I'm up on Africa. That's us. We're black women. You know, black African extremists, is, right? Extremism in Africa and China and Russia that they have to contend with. This is what we're looking at. This is things that's that's challenging the existing political and economic configuration of the globe right now, and they're concentrated on that. The struggle we're involved in is bigger than Redbud uh, uh, Avenue in St. Louis. And we have to really step up and recognize what our responsibility is uh, to pursue our freedom, our liberation, and to be absolutely completely dissatisfied with the whole notion that anybody should ever govern us again except ourselves. Y'all heard me? Yeah. Have to be absolutely dissatisfied. And just saying it ain't enough. You got to do something, right? So anyway, I've over-talked it. And I want to recognize uh, uh, Black Agenda Report uh, for being on the scene. Comment Margaret Kimberly. Uh, <laughs> Glenn Ford was my dear comrade. In fact, uh, he worked with me in terms of uh, creating the National Black Political Agenda for Self Determination I just told you about. You know, and. Uh, so I want to just thank you so much. You've been so kind to me. You didn't throw a single object at me. Um, <laughs> and I know I exceeded the time frame that you had allowed me to speak. I'm hoping that your presence here also means that you are prepared to take a stance around this case. I really hope that you're willing to do that. And there are all kinds of ways that you can do that. Uh, lawyers are really important. What happens to us, brothers and sisters, too often is that, um, that the so-called white liberals and white leftists who have all the resources in the world, they have resources, they have lawyers, they have money. Uh, one of the most notorious leftists, uh, uh, white leftists from this country, his dad was a judge in Oakland. He used to follow the Black Panther Party around all the time, you know? Uh, now, I used to hear about he was the greatest revolutionary since Malcolm X, this white guy who lives in France. Uh, and, uh, 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 but the thing is this, we are going to use all the democratic space that we fought for. This whole issue of elections, it was Africans who died fighting to, to, to be able to participate in elections. I don't remember a single white person except somebody who was riding with some black people who were doing voter registration uh, uh, who was killed. Black people, our churches were bombed and what have you. We fought for that space. We fought for that space. And we have to maintain that space. But the fact is that what they would do in every instance is shut down all the democratic space. So you don't have any of the democratic space. You can't run for office. You can't talk about this. You can't do this and do that. And when they shut down the democratic space, they can push you into being underground prematurely. Huey P. Newton was right that a revolutionary never voluntarily go, goes underground. You want all the democratic space. We fought for that democratic space. That's why to deny us lawyers, to deny us the kind of resources is collaboration. It's collaboration with, our, with the colonizers because they will push us into premature actions. And we need to exhaust every bit of the democratic space that's available. That's the process of winning African people to a greater consciousness and a greater state of organization so that we can take back power over our own lives. Uhuru! Uhuru. Uhuru. Uhuru.